Okay, we're continuing our study in Ephesians chapter 4. And for those of you who are watching by internet, um, <clears throat> this is a subject which we're dealing with this morning that is, uh, has been much discussion on. And I don't think it really has to be, but uh, anyway, we're going to look at it this morning. And uh, it's kind of uh, uh, strange if you look at commentators, that even what you call grace commentators, when they get to this particular passage, they, they just kind of just don't mention a word about it, just keep right on going. And uh, so anyway, we, we need to know, we need to study the Word of God, and uh, the answer is, we want to know the answers from a certain verse or something, it's elsewhere in the Scriptures. So we just read the Scriptures and study it, I think we can, uh, we can find out some answers. Anyway, we're going to look at a particular passage this morning, Ephesians 4. Now we're going to start out in Ephesians 4 verse 7, which we already uh, uh, talked about last week just a little bit. It says, but unto every one of us is or was given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So everything, every single one of us that are members of the body of Christ today in this dispensation, the age of grace, we have been given a measure of grace. And I think everyone would not argue with that at all. <laughs> uh, it is purely by God's grace that we can even have salvation today. Uh, by simply believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on the cross. So, yes, you know, we have been given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, as we go on, you will see more of that as, uh, as we go on. But now, notice it says grace was given. Uh, you might have is, and that's okay, but you could, you could also put it as was, was given. And it always, it, and it always is given. <laughs> Is or was, but use both of them. Given grace according to the measure. Now it says grace was given. Now I, I, I like to once in a while look at the tenses and the verbs in the Greek for certain phrases and so forth. And grace was given, it's in the aorist tense and the passive voice. The passive voice is something that you see in Paul's epistles that he uses many, many times in writing uh, his epistles. And most of the time when he uses that, the passive voice, now if you remember your English in school, the passive voice means what? Anybody? <coughs> Action was done by someone else. Someone else, someone else not you. <laughs> done by someone else. Well, in this, in this case, of course, it was Christ. Christ is what uh, uh, gave us a measure of grace. It was given to each one of us. And the heiress tense, all that means that it happened at a point of time. So at the time that we were saved, we definitely were given a measure of grace by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so the heiress tense, a given point of time in the past, and it, by the way, that action continues on. Uh, so, but it was in the passive voice, which means by it was done by the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 12, 3 through 6, I'm just going to read this here. It kind of fits in. Uh, a little bit what we're talking about. He says, For I say, though the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now we have a measure of grace, and now we have a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Now he's speaking of the body of Christ. There are many members. If you, then in uh, Romans and in Corinthians, he uh, makes the analogy of the body of Christ to the human body, our physical human body. And there's many members. We have arms, legs, ears, eyes, fingers, toes, and each one of us is a different part of that body. And there is a necessary function for each part of the body of Christ. And not only in our physical body is that true, but it is also true in the body of Christ, the spiritual organism that we are members of, the body of Christ. Uh, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ. Even though there are many members, there's only one body. It is the body of Christ. Um, and in every one, members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. All right, now let's go back. Well, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, 
but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So now we have a measure of grace, a measure of faith, and now we see a manifestation of the Spirit to each one of us. So it's uh, several things that God has given to us as members of the body of Christ through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, remember, everything that we have in God is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no way to God of the universe other than through the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, okay, let's go on to Ephesians 4, verse 8 here. And it says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Uh, it says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high. Well, first of all, who's the he? The Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. And you could, you could sum that up in an English uh, term, maybe liberation. And that is a phrase that is really, has been hard for many Bible teachers and, and preachers to look at and say, what in the world is he talking about? Led captivity captive. What is it but that also he had descended first in the lower parts of the earth. Lower parts really is, in the Greek, the abyss. Well, what is the abyss? Well, we're going to look at that. It says, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Well, what is that telling us? That's telling us that the Lord Jesus Christ, who ascended into the heavens, he also descended. Well, where he did descend to? Yes, he was buried, he was in a grave, but he went further than that. And uh, he sent it first into the lower parts, the abyss of the earth. Well, if you study out the word abyss, what, where is that at? Yeah. Well, the closest we can tell in scripture, it's in the center of the earth. The bottomless pit <laughs> uh, it is referred to. Okay, so now, that, that brings up a lot of questions. <laughs> The Lord Jesus Christ, he ascended into heaven, okay, we don't have any problem with that. For Acts chapter 1 talks about his ascension into heaven, and also in Matthew it talks about he ascended unto the Father uh, before he saw the 12 disciples after his resurrection. And, uh, but anyway, we won't go into that in all that detail, but, uh, so we know that he ascended, but it says also he descended first into the abyss or the center of the earth. So we have to fill it, get some more information here. Now, as far as leading captivity of captive, uh, it's a liberation. Uh, Paul evidently is quoting, uh, if you've studied it out, it's more, more than likely, but not <laughs> um, absolutely. How can I put that? <laughs> He's quoting from Psalm 68, verse 18, which David writes, and he says, uh, concerning leading captivity captive. Well, why does uh, David know something about captivity captive? Well, if you go back to Judges in the Old Testament, you know, lead, uh, captivity captive was not an unknown phrase that, that the Jewish people did not know about. They knew about leading captivity captive. Well, why is that? Because in Judges chapter 5, now I'm just going to have to summarize this here for you, but there was a time back in the Judges that uh, certain uh, Jewish people were um, held captive by the Canaanites in the middle of the country of Israel there, where the Canaanites dwelt. And so there were several Jewish people that were held captive there, or held against their will, uh, by the Canaanites. Now, if you've been with us when we studied about the, uh, the sons of God in Genesis 6 and the Nephilim and all this kind of stuff, and you, you understand and realize who the Canaanites are and why they were so wicked. And of course, the biggest reason is, is because they were influenced much by the fallen angels uh, in Genesis chapter 6 who uh, um, came down took wives whom they chose and so forth, and they had their offspring, which became the giants, which is called the Nephilim. And of course, this is later on, we know the Nephilim themselves were all destroyed at the flood. But then we find 
that there were also uh, those that the, of the um, offspring of the Nephilim after the flood. And this, of course, was part of the Canaanites. And they were very, very wicked people. And, uh, and we've gone all through that back when we went through the, the Nephilim and so forth. But anyway, if you, if, you, if you understand some of that, then you understand what was happening with the Canaanites and what was happening to the, the, these Jewish people who were held captive by the Canaanites. Now, in Judges uh, 5, 11 and 12 here, it says, They are delivered from the noise of the archers in the places of drawing water. There shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. Now this is getting ready. The archers and soldiers of Israel were going to go and, and uh, get these Israelites that were held captive by the Canaanites. And it says, Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, utter a song, arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. Now, what all that is, is, is uh, to go down with an army into the Canaanites and get, get the, other, the, the Jews that were being held by the Canaanites. And they were held captive. So, Barak goes down and he says, and lead thy captivity captive. The captivity of the Jews, lead them out of there. And this is not only a phrase that is used just for this, but there's other times when Israel went to war, they always, uh, not always, but uh, a lot of times they, they would capture some of those that they were warring against and held them captive. And it's the same thing happens today in wars. You know, they capture part of the enemy. Well, that's what the Canaanites did to Israel, to the Jewish people, and they were holding some of the Jews captive. And now, <clears throat> he's talk, this Barak was to go down and lead thy captivity captive. In other words, to liberate them from uh, their captivity. Well, now, as we go on, let's look at that uh, in relationship to Ephesians 4. Uh, let's see. I don't know if I want to... All right, well, let's go on here. Romans 10, I put this one in, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, saying, not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from heaven, or who shall descend into the deep, the abyss, that's the deep. The deep there is the Greek word for abyss, abyssos, I think it is. That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Now, if you're a believer, you're not gonna, you're not gonna say in your heart, you know, well, Who's to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up again from the dead. Um, so it's mentioned. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about this time. Um, uh, that was back in Genesis chapter 6. And you see the connection here in a minute. For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Of course, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, which he was, but quickened by the Spirit. He was put to death in the flesh, crucified, crucified on the cross, but quickened by the Spirit, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Notice by which, by the Holy Spirit, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Well, who are the spirits in prison? <laughs> which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, were in a few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Okay, so the spirits in prison are spirits that sometimes were living back in, at the time of Noah, while the 120 years, while, while Noah was preparing an ark uh, for the flood. Well, let's go on a little more. In Second Peter, 
he talks about, again, he says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, really it's Tartarus, and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. He's talking about those spirits in prison. That is back in, in Ephesians 4. Uh, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now we know that the, the times of Noah, the sons of God, which we see in, in uh, chapter 6 there, which were divine beings out of, out of heaven, came down to earth and married the uh, human women on the earth and had offspring, and those offspring were just called the Nephilim or uh, the giants, men of renown and so forth. And uh, because they were hybrids, uh, and history tells us, and there's a lot of scripture for this, that they were extremely wicked, wicked people. And that's why we find God coming down and having to destroy the earth. Because by this time, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of the offspring of, of the Nephilim on the earth. Uh, some people estimate that the number of people on the earth at the time of the flood were anywhere from 2 billion up to 6 billion. So you can, uh, I know there's, there's some uh, that have gone back into Genesis and all the way through up until Noah uh, and figured out how many people there actually were on the earth or a good estimate. Because remember, a lot of those people lived up to 900 years old and they were having children all that time. <laughs> uh, I think it's Haley's Bible Handbook says that Adam and Eve even had over 100 children themselves. Uh, so I don't know exactly where they get that information, but anyway, that's what they tell us. So uh, it's very possible that there were billions of people on the earth at the time of the flood. But anyway, okay, we're talking about the spirits in prison. Um, in Jude, Jude already uh, talks about the same ones, and it said that the angels, now the angels are the sons of God uh, in Genesis 6. Now, you might say, well, how, how can you call them sons of God? Well, we, get, we don't have time to go into that, but there's many references that speak to the, about the sons of God that they are angels. There's no doubt about that. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, their heavenly habita uh, habitation, and it came down. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Those are the spirits in prison. Those are ones... The ones that came down, and uh, according to the book of Enoch, if you uh, <clears throat> read that at all, there were about 200 of them that came down to the earth at that particular time. And uh, they are reserved in chains of darkness in the center of the earth and until the day of judgment. Well, the day of judgment, of course, is in the latter half of the tribulation period and we will see that there is a connection between, uh, we'll, well, we'll see it here in a minute, but it, there's a connection between those that are spirits in prison and those that are released onto the earth in the second half of the tribulation period. Revelation chapter 9 speaks of that. Okay. Now, we have to know a little bit about, I don't know why this is in white here, but anyway, uh, the word hell. We have it in Matthew 6, uh, 18, and it comes from the Greek word Hades. I, if you study hell at all in the scriptures, you're going to come across the Greek word Hades. <laughs> uh, that's primarily the translation from Hades into hell in the New Testament, in the Greek. That's the Greek, Greek word, Hades. And really what all that means is the unseen world. Now in the Old Testament... Well, I guess this is just the new here. <laughs> Mark 9.34, we have the word hell also, and that comes from the Greek word Gehenna, unquenchable fire. And that, Gehenna is a place, uh, the, uh, it's called the, the Valley of Hinnon in Jerusalem, just outside the city wall of Jerusalem where they threw all the garbage. And there was a, con a, a continuing burning of garbage all the time, and that's where we get the everlasting fire, the... the, the unquenchable fire. There was always a fire there, so they used that particular word, and that's for another word where we get translated into hell. There are actually about seven different Greek words 
in the New Testament that are translated into our English, hell. So it becomes very confusing if you really want to study it out, uh, where the word hell is used. Now, get this in the black. Um, this is kind of a chart that tells you where hell is and what it, what it means and so forth. Like, an uns, like I said, unseen world in the Old Testament is called Sheol. Sheol and Hades in the New Testament are synonymous. Same place. Unseen world in the scriptures. Now what's in the unseen world? Well, here it is, right here. And it's as far as the scriptures uh, uh, tell us, it is in the center of the earth. There are compartments in the unseen world. There's one called paradise. And we learn about this in Luke 16. You have the uh, story of Lazarus and the rich man. And uh, Lazarus went to paradise, or Abraham's bosom, and the rich man, of course, went over here to the land of torments. Well, remember, in Luke 16, there was a great gulf in between the two? That's what it says. And what did, what did uh, the rich man uh, evidently could see Lazarus, or a rich man over here could see Lazarus over in Abraham's bosom, and what did he ask? Yes. Yeah, bring me just a drop of water, a little bit of water. So that tells you a lot about what the place of torment is, and uh, uh, we're going to see back and forth? Well, possibly. But anyway, then this is where we a lot, lot of times uh, refer to, when we think of hell, this is actually what we're really thinking of a lot of time in Scripture. Uh, we say the rich man was in hell. Well, he really wasn't in hell yet. Uh, that that the unsaved, the unsaved dead are in a place called the place of torments, which you see in Luke 16. But the unsaved, all throughout the scriptures, will be resurrected at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. We have the tribulation period after this age, the age of grace, after the rapture takes place, the tribulation period begins for seven years. We have the judgment of God Second coming of Christ, he comes back down, sets up his kingdom on the earth for 1,000 years. And that's exactly what the Jewish people were looking for, was their Messiah and their king to set up their kingdom, to set up the kingdom on the earth. And they will, the unsaved will all be in this place of, uh, in the center of the earth, in, in Hades. In fact, in Revelation here, 20, 14 to 15, it mentions Hades, that they will, they will be coming from Hades, and they will be cast into the lake of fire, which is now unoccupied, but the lake of fire, which is uh, prepared for the devil and his angels. So we have the devil and the angels and all the unsaved will be cast into the lake of fire here in uh, Revelation chapter 20 here and, and some other references here for it. So that's just basically, we can spend a lot of time here. Now, notice this one here. Uh, let's see, we read in Peter, 2 Peter 2.4, that these spirits in prison were cast down to hell? Well, the English word is hell, but the Greek word is Tartarus. Only one time is that, is that word used in Scripture, and it's 2 Peter 2, 4. That's it. One time. That's the only time that that Greek word is used. And that is a place where we find that they are chained in darkness. These are the spirits in prison, the, the the, uh, the spirits in prison is referred to. They are the sons of God, the angels which came down at the time of Noah. And they are chained there now, and they will be chained there until the time of judgment when God will take them out. And uh, they will be on the earth for a short period of time to torture men, which is Revelation 9 talks about it. They talk about the locusts there. Uh, many believe that the locusts there are actually these spirits in prison, we know that they're going to be released during the tribulation period. And of course then they will be destroyed at, at the judgment. But anyway, that gives you a little bit about the unseen world. Now, when, when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, it said here in Ephesians 4 that he descended into the lower parts of the earth or the abyss. Well, this is the abyss right here, lower parts of the earth, center of the earth. Well, what was he doing down here? He was preaching to the people to believe. 
He was making a proclamation. He was preaching to the spirits in prison. Right here. But also, remember, when he was on the cross of Calvary and uh, one of the thieves uh, said, remember me uh, in heaven, or what, I forget the exact words that he used, remember me. And Jesus said, today thou will be with me, where? In paradise. Paradise. So as soon as he died, he spent three days right here. And his proclamation, his preaching was to the spirits in prison. Why? Well, if you know about the Nephilim, if you know about all what happened in the Old Testament, and now these spirits are uh, that destroyed the earth, <laughs> actually, uh, at the time of Noah, uh, now he's proclaiming to them what he had just accomplished on the cross of Calvary. And he's proclaiming that message to them. And uh, also, remember, these spirits in prison will never, never in all eternity have a chance to be saved. They are doomed for the eternal judgment. They cannot be saved whatsoever. There's many scriptures for that, but we don't have time to get into that. But anyway, now let's go back. Uh, read a, some, some verses here that Paul writes, and it's kind of connection with this. In Colossians chapter 2, verse, verses 13, 14, and 15, Paul says, and you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. Now he's speaking to, remember, Paul always writes to believers, never to unbelievers. He always writes to believers. And he says to these believers, you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision, uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now, uh, where else do we see this, that you were dead in your sins and, he, he, and you, then you were quickened? Remember? Ephesians 2 talks about the, uh, when he was writing earlier concerning those believers at Ephesus. This is the state that you were in. You were dead in your sins, but God has quickened you. And of course, that was through the Spirit. Same way here. But notice he says, having forgiven you all trespasses, isn't this the past ones that they committed, or the present ones that maybe some of them were committing, or the future ones that we're going to commit, all trespasses. And remember, he's speaking to the members of the body of Christ, that when Christ died on the cross of Calvary, he paid for all sin. The entire world. 2 Corinthians 5. He reconciled the world unto himself. The death of the, the when he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. It wasn't just for believers, it was for every single person on the earth that has ever lived. He paid for sin for every single person. It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that is referring to the law that was against us. He blotted that out at the time of the cross. We are not under law, but we are under grace. And we see that many times in Paul's epistle, especially in Romans. We're no longer under law, we're under grace. Uh, took it out of the way, nailed it to the cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumph triumphing over them in it. And he's speaking what he showed, the principalities and powers are all those that are in heavenly places, the spiritual beings in heavenly places, whether they're uh, good angels or bad angels or whoever, demons, whatever the case may be, principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. And uh, I, don't, I, I think, well, primarily in this verse, he's talking about the cross of Calvary, what he did, in payment for the sin of the whole world, triumphing over them in it. Uh, there are a couple other places in Scripture I think he did almost the same thing, but we won't take time to go into that now. You can ask me about that some other time. Okay, so now, verse 11, let's see. Okay, we'll go to verse 11, Ephesians 4, 11. When he did this, when he went into the center of the earth, for three days he come out, ascended into the heavens. We know in Acts chapter 1, he ascended into the heavens. And he, at that time, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers 
for the perfecting of the saints, for the working of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, as you read this scripture, do you know exactly what, as you read this, these last few verses, and now all of a sudden he gave some apostles? How does that all fit together? You know, I've wondered about that a long time. He talks about him going to the center of the earth and so forth and speaking to the, uh, preaching to the spirits in prison. And then all of a sudden, he gave some apostles, some prophets. What's the connection? Why does Paul say it this way? I mean, why does he all of a sudden say that he gave some apostles, some prophets, evangelists, the pastors, teachers, for the perfecting or the act of perfectly equipping and fully preparing and restoring? That's what perfecting, perfecting means. Uh, the act of perf perfectly equipping and fully preparing or restoring the saints. For what reason? For the work of the ministry for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. So, remember when the Lord Jesus Christ was on earth, who were the ones, or who were the ones, that uh, was included in his ministry, or part of his ministry, for all the Jewish people, or for the world, it was supposed to be in the future, the 12, the 12 apostles. Well, we find out when the Apostle Paul comes on the scene, the 12 apostles, for the most part, they were still in Jerusalem, and they just kind of fall by the wayside. Well, now when God introduces this new age of grace, uh, this new apostle, the Apostle Paul, he says, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles, and we find the beginning of the body of Christ, which was completely foreign to what Christ's ministry was to the Jewish people, or the 12 apostles' ministry was to the Jewish people, completely foreign to that. And the 12 apostles are still going to the, uh, uh, the circumcision or the Jews at this particular time. We see in Galatians, Paul talks about the Galatians chapter, chapter 2. Remember when the apostle Paul was there and speaking to the, to the 12 in Jerusalem? This was after he was saved, after he began his ministry. And they agreed. They shook hand, right hands of fellowship. Uh, Peter, James, and John with the Apostle Paul and saying, okay, you go to the uncircumcision, we'll stay and go to the circumcision. And so there was a, uh, uh, a difference there, a different, uh, uh, different teaching, obviously. Okay, now it says apostles and some prophets. Now, we know that the, the ministry of the Apostle Paul was progressive. Uh, we see that in the book of Acts and so forth. And we, do, we realize that it wasn't until the end of the book of Acts and, his, and when, he, when Paul was in prison that he came to the full revelation, the full knowledge of the mystery or the body of Christ, of the revelation of the mystery. It wasn't until that time until he had a full knowledge of that. Now, <clears throat> and after that, or during that time, before... Uh, he was imprisoned in Rome, we find that there were apostles with him. Not only the apostle Paul, but we had, who else did we have as apostles? <laughs> we had uh, Saul and, and Silas and Timothy, and there were several there that worked with the apostle Paul, and they were called apostles. So there were apostles and some prophets. There were some prophets at that time, particular time too. And then uh, the prophets can be either one of two things. Either they're, they're a person that can foretell the future, or nothing more, the, the word means just a proclamation. Uh, just as such that maybe I'm doing here, proclaiming God's word, the prophet, you consider a prophet in that sense. Uh, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, for the most part, when the revelation of the mystery was given fully to the Apostle Paul while he was in prison in Rome at that particular time, since then, there is really no need for apostles and prophets as far as foretelling the future and so forth. They have kind of dropped by the wayside. Why? Because now we have the full revelation of the mystery. We have the apostle Paul has fulfilled the scriptures. Colossians 2 tell us that he, he fulfilled the scriptures. Um, so it's not necessary, but we do have evangelists, necessary. Uh, some pastors and teachers, that's that uh, uh, actually is from one Greek word, pastors and teachers. A pastor 
not, not necessarily uh, the pastor and teacher. A pastor should be a teacher. <clears throat> the teacher does not necessarily have to be the, have to do the duties of a pastor. There are teachers and then there are pastor teachers. But a pastor should be able to teach, should be a teacher. <clears throat> what reason? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Okay. Uh, he goes on. For how long is this going to take place? Until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. You may have in your Bible, you may have just unity of faith. I don't know. But it's, uh, it is really the definite articles in front of it, and it says the faith. Well, what is the faith? If it, when we, we speak to people and sometimes we say, well, what faith are you? Of what faith you are? You know, are you Baptist, Presbyterian, whatever, German, Norwegian, whatever? I guess that wouldn't be a faith, but... Till we all come the unity of the faith, a definite article. What is the faith that the Apostle Paul refers to? Well, the faith is the gospel of the grace of God according to the revelation of the mystery. Romans 16, 25. And uh, he tells us that's the way we, as members of the body of Christ, can be established by understanding and knowing what the revelation of the mystery is. And that's how... That is the gospel, the grace of God. That's how the Apostle Paul presents the Lord Jesus as, um, <clears throat> a, as a, according to the revelation of the mystery. And we don't have time to get into all what the mystery is now. But anyway, let's go on in this verse. Send unto a perfect man unto the measure, the stature of the fullness of Christ. It says, uh, well, I skipped the end of the knowledge of the Son of God. <laughs> The knowledge, uh, that's an interesting word in Scripture. Apostle Paul uses it many times, many times. Uh, you have basically two Greek words for uh, uh, knowledge in Scripture, gnosis and epigenosis. And this particular one, again, the Apostle Paul uses for knowledge here, is epigenosis. Well, gnosis just means knowledge, okay? But if you put epi, the prefix epi in front of it, uh, then it means a clear and exact full knowledge of whatever you're talking about. So that's what he's talking about. That's the desire of the Apostle Paul for members of the body of Christ, that we come into the unity of the faith, the gospel, the grace of God, and of the knowledge, the full and exact knowledge of the Son of God, which results unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Perfect, complete, full, wanting nothing else. And that is the desire that we should have of ourselves and of other believers, uh, just as Paul did of those uh, believers that he wrote to. Colossians 1, he says, if we continue in the faith, Grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Wherefore, I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, till and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for the body's sake, which is the church. Now, notice, wherefore, I am made a minister, according to what? According to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill or complete the word of God. God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, gave the Apostle Paul this faith, the gospel of the grace of God, to fill up, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me, was given to him by God for those... Uh, believers as well as us members of the body of Christ to complete the word of God to fulfill or it really means to complete the word of God now what <coughs> completed the word of God notice the remainder of this verse 26 here it says even the mystery even is in italics which the translators added for us to better understand and uh, here I would think we'd better understand it if they just left it out 
Because if you if you read that right, it says, uh, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill or complete the word of God, the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is manifest to his saints. So it is the revelation of a mystery given to the Apostle Paul is what completes the word of God. And we could have a whole sermon just on that. How in the world did that alone complete the word of God? Because we know there were other writers after the Apostle Paul, right? That wrote Revelation, 1st, 2nd, 3rd of John, James, Peter, and so forth. All come afterward. But they were for the revelation of what was talked about earlier in the Old Testament and in the Gospels. But this here is a secret. It was never before made known until God gives it to the Apostle Paul. Um, Okay, just look at the dispensational time period again, and maybe you can help to understand this, but you're going to get tired of seeing this, but I've got to put it up there again. You always remember by repetition, right? So we're going to repeat it. <laughs> Notice the biblical timeline. <laughs> Starts with Adam all the way back here. It goes all the way through the scriptures, and we have, the, this is where the uh, 12 apostles were right here. <clears throat> then uh, they were looking forward. Here we have the ascension of Christ right there in the first part of Acts. And what were they looking forward to? They were looking forward to this kingdom, knowing that they had to go through this tribulation. In fact, Peter at Pentecost in the first part of Acts, when they were speaking in tongues and so forth in the first part of Acts at Pentecost, uh, some of them were saying, hey, these people are drunk. They don't know what they're doing. Peter says, no, 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 it's only the third hour of the day. He says, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And that's in Joel chapter 2. And he was almost word for word repeating what Joel had in Joel chapter 2 in the Old Testament, which was entirely about the tribulation period, right here. That was the next, next thing on the timeline, was the tribulation period. And of course, second coming of Christ, which they were looking forward to, their Messiah, and setting up the kingdom. Notice nation of Israel, from Genesis 12 all the way through the scriptures to Revelation 20. Now what's missing? The age we're in. The age we're living in. Where are we at on that timeline? We're not there. Not there. But what did God do? Well, he inserted it. Now we have, from that time period, back in the first part of Acts there, until uh, the rapture takes place, we have this Age of Grace, which is called the mystery. Why? Because it never before made known. It was a secret. We have the Apostle Paul, who is the Apostle of the Gentiles, of the Age of Grace. The primary um, references, uh, Book of Romans through Philemon, covers concerning the body of Christ and the Age of Grace. This is always a secret. Nobody before here knew anything about it. The 12 Apostles knew nothing about it. They never preached anything about this. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry never told anything about the body of Christ, never mentioned it, not one single time. Why? Because what they were preaching back here was looking forward to here, the tribulation and the kingdom. But when Israel as a nation rejected uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and the, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, God introduced a new program right here and uh, introduced the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, and which back here, there was no hope for the Gentiles whatsoever. Ephesians 2 tell us, tells us that. Uh, let's see. And we don't need to go to this, I guess, but anyway, this is just a little more about the, uh, the book of Acts and Paul's epistles. We find Paul's, the early Paul's epistles, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Romans, were all written during this transitional period from the dispensation of the law to the dispensation of grace. And here we have from the Apostle Paul comes on the scene until uh, Acts 28, the end of Acts, we have a progressive revelation of the gospel of the grace of God. And once we hit that, at the end of the bu uh, book of Acts, when Paul's in prison, from then on, we find his prison epistles, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Hebrews, Titus, 2nd Timothy. We've got Hebrews in there. It's 1st and 2nd Timothy. Uh, notice, no reference to signs, miracles, wonders, tongues, or legal ceremonies. Nothing of that because now it's entirely the age of grace 
the revelation of the mystery, which uh, extends to us information concerning the benefits of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I uh, just, I, my desire is, I hope that every one of you here today know and understand the Lord Jesus Christ, what he has done for you on the cross of Calvary. And uh, um, so let's uh, close with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for what uh, you have done for us on the cross of Calvary. And we just praise you, Heavenly Father, for the information that you have shown us that we can know and understand what you have for us as each one of us, members of the body of Christ, regardless of what part of the body we are, that the Holy Spirit can work through us, that we can all be united in that one faith, the gospel, the grace of God. So be with us now. Uh, keep us safe, uh, keep us, um, and uh, give us that desire to study your word that we might come back and, and uh, have fellowship once again around your word. This we ask in your precious name. Amen.